the first statement on the upper right of your screen calls the method named get modified data as defined by the code on the lower right of your screen. This causes the original random value less 1 to be printed. The second statement on the upper right of your screen causes the original random data value to be printed. The third statement on the upper right of your screen calls the method named get modified data as defined in the lower right of your screen. This causes the original random value plus one to be printed. Because this third statement is a call to the method name PRINTLN, the on-screen cursor advances to the left side of the next line on the screen after the value is printed. The three statements on the upper right of your screen cause the first three values to be printed as shown on the bottom right of your screen. Continuing with the driver class, the code on the upper right of your screen shows three more print statements. The first and third of these print statements call the get data method on objects instantiated from the two classes. Once again, a cast is required because the references to the objects were saved as type data, I'm sorry, were saved as type object and the class named object doesn't know anything about a method named get data. As you should recall, the behavior of the get data method is the same in both objects. The get data method simply returns a copy of the original random value that was passed to the constructor when each of the objects was instantiated. Therefore, the three print statements in the upper right of your screen cause the output that I am now highlighting to be displayed on the command line. These three values match because all three print statements are printing essentially the same value. The original random value is printed by the middle statement and a copy of the original random value is printed by the first and the third statements. As you should recall from an earlier lesson, Whenever an object's reference is passed to either the print method or the print line method, the first thing that happens is that the toString method is called on the reference. The toString method always returns a reference to an object of the string class, and that string is printed by the print or print line method. As you should also recall, the toString method was overridden in both of the classes that I defined in this program. Therefore, I'm not going to go through those details again. You should also recall that the toString method was overridden in both classes in such a way that when it is called on an object of either class it will return a string representation of the value stored in the variable named data plus 
5. The first statement on the right of your screen passes the reference to the object stored in the first element of the array to the print method. Similarly, the third statement passes the reference to the object stored in the second element of the array to the print ln method. The middle statement on the upper right of your screen adds 5 to the original random data value and prints the sum. The three print statements in the upper right of your screen cause the values that I am now highlighting to be printed on the command line. In all three cases, the value displayed is the original random value plus 5. If you examine the code on the upper right of your screen carefully, you will see that I applied a cast operator to the references when I removed them or when I extracted them from the array elements. However, that was not required and that cast operator is superfluous. Casting the references to the interface type prob05x in this case was not necessary. It was not necessary because the original definition of the toString method appears in the class named object. The toString method can be called on those objects when they are being treated as though they are of type object without the requirement for a cast. This is a very powerful aspect of object-oriented programming known as runtime polymorphism. In this case, without the cast, runtime polymorphism would cause the overridden versions of the two-string methods to be executed instead of the default version of the two-string method that is defined in the object class. So you may be wondering why I put the cast operators here in the first place. I put those cast operators there to remind me to tell you that they are not necessary in this particular case. And to remind me to explain that in this case, had I not put them there, runtime polymorphism would have kicked in and would have taken care of the situation for me. The code in the upper right of your screen signals the end of the main method and the end of the class name prob05. When the main method has nothing further to do, it terminates, causing the program to terminate and return control to the operating system. That concludes lecture number 10, in which you learned about interface definitions, implementing an interface in a class definition, defining interface methods in a class definition, storing references to new objects in elements of an array of type object, casting array elements to an interface type in order to call interface methods, parameterize constructors, and last but not least, the overridden two-string method with a mention of runtime polymorphism. You can learn more about these topics by visiting my website at www.dickbaldwin.com.